time. So this morning we're going to be looking at two chapters, Exodus 3, Exodus 4. And what I want to do is look at the call of God on Moses' life, how the encounter that Moses has where God calls him to serve him. And it's interesting because when Moses gets called by God, he wasn't doing anything special or ordinary where he was preparing himself for God's call. He was living his ordinary life, doing what he was doing every single day. There was no hint at all in Moses' life that God was going to call him or God was going to show up and change his life forever. It was just a common, ordinary day shift taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. He had no idea that this day was going to be different or unique. Just another day at work for Moses. The sun came up, the sheep grazed, and Moses chalked off his 15,656th day at work um, as Jethro's shepherd. And all of a sudden, God shows up. And this is how God works, without warning. God speaks to ordinary people like you and like me on ordinary days in extraordinary ways. You might be waking up tomorrow to go back to school for a semester for the first time tomorrow. You might be facing a classroom full of students. You might be getting behind the wheel to go to work. You might be walking into class as a student. You might be even lifting your baby out of the crib that's your day. That's your routine. That's your Mount Horeb where God will show up and meet you. And it may be on such a normal day that God will choose to speak to you something great on his heart, something that pertains to the purposes that he has for your life here on this earth. And friends, I don't know where you are this morning. Maybe it's just another Sunday. And you're here because simply this is what you've been doing on Sunday mornings for God knows how long. This is another ordinary routine day. And you're here, and maybe you've never even considered if God could use someone like you. My prayer is that God would speak to you, would make himself known to you like he's never done before, and that you would trust that God could use someone like you for his glory. This is where Moses was. He thought he could never be used. He thought that his usefulness was done. Some of you in this room feel like you failed. You thought that you were going to go out and do something great for God like Moses did and failed miserably. You fell flat on your faces. Now you've been sitting on the sidelines. Some of you are simply... Moses, at this stage of life, just simply going through the routines of life, you're just working, going day in and day out, and you wonder if God could ever use you. Moses, at this point, 40 years in the wilderness, shepherding sheep day in and day out. His friends were his sheep, never thought anything significant would happen in his life. And then all of a sudden, Exodus 3 happens. And before we dive into Exodus 3, let me give you a quick reminder of everything that's happened In Exodus 1 and 2, because a lot of stuff has happened in those first two chapters. In Exodus 1, we find the people of Israel, the children of God, living in captivity in the land of Israel, in the land of Egypt. The people of Israel are enslaved in Egypt, and Egypt is being built on the back of the slave labor of the Israelites. But the nation of Israel is growing. Their people are increasing. They are being fruitful and multiplying. And the people are beginning to outnumber their oppressors to the point that the Egyptians now become concerned. And so Pharaoh passes a law that all the sons that are born to Hebrew women were to be executed. But the mother of Moses decides that she would not heed to the law of Pharaoh, but that she would spare her son. So she creates a basket and makes this basket out of reeds, and she puts Moses into this basket and hides Moses along the banks of the Nile River. And one of Pharaoh's daughters one day comes to bathe at the Nile River and notices this basket and sends for her servants to get this basket and realizes there's a baby in there. And she immediately falls in love with this baby and takes this baby and takes him back home. 
And now Moses is living in the home of the man that had basically sentenced him to die. And he was being raised in the house of an Egyptian pharaoh. He is educated. And he lives a luxurious life in Pharaoh's home until he's 40 years old. And at the age of 40, Moses sees some of the Hebrew people being abused by the taskmasters, and out of anger, he ends up murdering an Egyptian. And the story tells us that Pharaoh found out about what Moses did, and he began to pursue Moses, and Moses leaves Egypt and runs to the backside of the Midian desert. And in the Midian desert, Moses meets a man by the name of Jethro, who is a shepherd. Moses ends up falling in love with Jethro's daughter, Sephora, Sephora, and for 40 years, Moses is just simply a shepherd doing daily shepherd duties, thinking that he is done. He has no contact with other Hebrews, no contact with his former Egyptian friends, living his life as a shepherd, a husband, a father, minding his own business. And then you get to chapter 3 of Exodus. And in chapter 3 of Exodus, Moses is now 80 years old. Let that sink in for a moment. 80 years old. Most of what we know that was accomplished by Moses, some pretty significant stuff. Their entire movies have been made about this stuff, right? Most of what has happened in Moses' life has happened after Moses was already 80 years old. Look at Exodus 3, verse 1. Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. And as Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire but was not consumed. And so Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come closer, he said. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he continued, I am the Lord, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their sufferings, and I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them to the land, to a good land flowing with milk and honey. And the territory of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Parasites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And so because Israelites' cry for help has come to me, I have also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them, and therefore go. I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Here God speaks to Moses. I want to pull three things out of this text, just three things I, want, I truly believe that God wants us to hear this morning about what God is calling for us. Number one, to be used by God, we have to listen for God's voice. We are called to listen to God's voice. In verse 4, the Bible says that God called him. It's a word that means summon. It's a word that means invite or to call. The Bible says Moses responded by saying, here I am. That phrase expresses a strong feeling. I don't know if you remember growing up for me in school, um, we had homeroom, right? In homeroom, their teacher would take out this book and open the book and would go name by name, and she would call a person's name out, and the person was supposed to answer present or here, right? And so everyone would do that, or you would be marked absent. But there's always this one kid in every class, I'm sure in yours as well, there's this, always this one kid that just really wanted to be the center of attention, right? I mean, and so when the teacher calls out, instead of just saying here or instead of just saying present, all of a sudden his hands are flying up and he's like, I'm here, I'm here, right? It's like he had way too much Kool-Aid early in the morning, right? And that was that one kid. That was kind of the feeling that Moses is having here. It's not like, oh, here I am. It's like, I'm here. God, I hear you, I'm here. Speak to me. This is the implication of verse 
for here. God called Moses from the bush, and in English it sounds like God Moses is just casually talking to this bush, but there is this anticipation, this excitement. The implication is that Moses is emotional, captured by the fact that he was hearing from someone who was calling his name. I'm here, God. I'm listening. Speak. God spoke. Moses was listening. The incredible story of Moses and his influence in the world began with a simple moment of listening to the voice of God. The incredible story of Moses and the influence that he had on the world began in a simple moment of listening to the voice of God. It didn't start in a strategy meeting or where Moses had a whiteboard and was trying to figure out all the things that he could do for God. It didn't happen in the middle of a revival service or a prayer meeting or a church service. It didn't happen that when Moses sat apart a certain few days to pray or fast. Think about all the things that Moses had done, the law of God, the tabernacle, the temple, all those principles that have permeated societies and histories of civilizations, and yet it started simply with Moses listening to the voice of God. And it makes me ponder the question, what have I missed out on because I simply don't listen to God's voice, where I simply don't listen for God to speak into my life. To be used by God to influence other people demands faith. Let me read a couple passages that are familiar to you about faith. Hebrews 11 says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. The writer is saying that without faith, you and I don't have the ability to do anything that honors God. And Romans 10 says that faith comes by what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message of Jesus. You hear what he says? It's not faith until you hear God speak. It's not faith until you hear God's voice. There, sometimes I hear well-intentioned people, well, well-meaning people say, well, we're not really sure what God is saying, so we're just going to take a step out in faith. Listen, that's not faith. That's foolishness. That's presumption on God, and that's a dangerous way to live your life. The Bible says it's not faith until I hear God speak into my life. If I am going to be used by God to make a difference in the people that he has put in my life, I have to be intentional about pursuing God's presence on a daily basis that I may hear his voice. Listen, he isn't often usually speak vocally from heaven like in this story, shouting, but he shouts down his word through his word. He speaks through his book. He uses his people and he uses events in your life to speak to you. And through the blending of these three things, he says, listen to me, pay attention to me, and I will speak to you. Answer my call and I will use you. All you need is that hushed spirit and a listening heart to listen to the voice of God. Moses possessed both of these things, and therefore, he heard the voice of God. Friends, we need to listen to hear God speak. Are you listening? Are you pursuing his presence? Are you listening to what God is saying? How does God speak? Great question. Let me give you two ways. Two ways that he speaks to me. Now, These are not the only ways that he speaks, but these are the two ways that I have experienced God speak into my life, that he often speaks into my life. Again, I'm not saying this is the only ways that God speaks, but this is from my experience. Number one, he uses his word in prayer. As I give time to prioritize his word, as I give time to spend time in prayer, God speaks. This happens privately in my devotional life, This happens publicly when we gather here together and God speaks through someone up here into your life and God gives you a word of something you're supposed to do. But God uses his word to speak into our lives. Most of you know that as a church, we were never wanting to be a church. We began as a Bible study years ago. 
My heart and desire when we started as a Bible study was that we would simply get together, study God's Word, because I knew that emotions and experiences and great music wasn't going to make a difference in people's lives. It had to be God's Word. I remember growing up in my church in Philly, they had this incredible encounter with Jesus one Sunday. And this girl, this girl that I was mentoring, called me and said, I encountered Jesus, and it was this incredible experience, and she was just on fire for Jesus. And literally a week later, her brother was killed in a car accident, and she gave up her faith. Her emotions was great one week, but her emotions were unable to sustain her faith when things got rough. The only way we get grounded is when we're grounded in God's word. When the Bible study began growing and people started coming and saying, oh, we shouldn't be a Bible study anymore, we should be a church, me and Ann weren't on board. <laughs> we did not want to be a church. We were burned. Some of you know our previous experience, how we basically had to leave a church because we were beat up and um, didn't want to serve in church ministry anymore. But God was doing something. And I won't forget the summer of 2010 when all these questions were going on on who we are, what we're supposed to do. I went and took a day off and went to a lodge that was near Mesquite and just spent a day there with my Bible and nothing else and just prayed. And I remember leaving that space the next day knowing that this is what God was calling for us to do. And here we are a little over seven years later in this journey of being a church. And God has done more than I would have ever imagined seven years ago. God has brought more people into this group that I never would have dreamed would have happened. We've sent teams to parts of India and Honduras. We've had influences in apartment communities. We've helped plant churches in New York and Johannesburg and Durban. We have seen students and leaders be a part of our church and then sent them off to serve in mission fields both here in the U.S. and across the country. Let me tell you, I asked myself a bunch of times what would I have missed if I hadn't paused and been with Jesus? And if I went with my own feelings instead of pausing to listen to the voice of God? Listen to me. God didn't need me. God didn't need me for this church to happen. God was doing this with or without Sam Jarboe. I'm not naive enough to think that if it, I hadn't been here, this wouldn't have happened. God was at work. God was at move. God was doing something in the city of Richardson and in the Dallas community. God was birthing Lost City for his glory, whether I was a part of it or not. God was doing it, but God loved me enough by his grace so much that he wanted me to get onto it, and it happened. It would have happened with me on board or not on board. What would Moses have missed if he hadn't been listening for the voice of God? Now listen, I'm not talking about one of these things where you're like, oh, I need God to speak to me, and you're like. You're laughing because you've done it, right? <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about intentionally carving out time where you say, God, you are the most important treasure of my life. If I don't spend time with you, if I am not connected with you in the vine, everything else will be a disaster. I need to be close with you. I need to be intimate with you. I need to pursue you, and God will speak to you out of the routine every day, sitting down, praying and reading God's word, and God will speak to you. The second way, in my experience, that God speaks is often through relationships with others. In my life, it seems, now this might seem completely strange to you, but I have had random people just come and say random stuff into my life that all of a sudden would be like exactly what I needed, right? Just, now, this word might scare some of you, but the word prophetic. People that would prophetically speak. I remember when we were trying to decide whether to be in Dallas, we were debating. We had an opportunity um, 
a, a job opened up for me, and I did not want to take the job. So I said the guy, I told the guy no, and the guy pursuing me was like, well, just pray about it. And I was like, no, I don't want to pray about it. Um, I want to go back to Philly and just uh, be close to family. And so came home, and my wife was like, well, we didn't pray about it. I was like, oh, that's two people. Then I guess we should pray about it. Um, and so that weekend, we were just praying about it. And so I was like, God, are you calling us to Dallas? You're not calling us to move. And so we, that Sunday after church, we went to have lunch with uh, my old roommate and his family. And we sit down, we're having lunch, and his mother just looks at us and goes, you're supposed to stay in Dallas. Listen, we hadn't told her. We, she had no idea we were specifically praying for that issue right then. How in the world did she know to say that right then? God. God speaks through people. God will speak to, through you if you would listen. The other times is often just simply through relationships. There are people in your life that senses what God is doing, and they will speak into your life. That's as I live out my relationship with him, in fellowship with other people, God speaks in my life through the community around me, which begs the question, who are you listening to? Who are the voices that are speaking into your life? Listen, friends, Christianity wasn't designed to be lived on an island by yourself. It was designed to be lived in community with other believers. Why? Because often the way that God speaks into our lives is through relationships that he has given to us as we walk with him. Who's speaking into your life? Who are you listening to? Who's got your ear? In my experience, those are the two primary ways that God speaks. My prayer for us this year is that we would be people that would listen to the voice of God. That we would be people that more than anything else, we would say, God, I want to hear your voice. That God, if I hear, if I sense you moving, I want to pause enough to say, God, what are you saying? And I want to listen. Number two, we need to look for the activity of God. We need to look for the activity of God. Look back at verses 2 and 3 of Exodus 3. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. And so Moses looked. He saw the bush was on fire but was not consumed. And so Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? Every one of those phrases, the Lord appeared. He looked. I must turn aside. I must see. All come from that root word to see. Moses was looking for God's activity. He was looking to see where God was working around him, and he took notice. I don't know if you've ever been through the Bible study by Henry Blackaby called Experiencing God. It's a study that's had a deep impact on my life. And in that study, Blackaby teaches this little principle that God is at work all around us all the time. And when we see God at work, it is God's invitation for us to get in on what he is doing, to join him. And that's what Moses does here. Moses was living a life of listening to the voice of God. And he was living a life of looking for the activity of God. And when he saw it, <laughs> he stopped what he was doing. And he dove into what God was doing. God, what are you up to? God, where are you moving? God, where are you working? God, how can I be involved? What are you asking of me? It's the same model that Jesus gives in the New Testament. Jesus, in his humanity, chose to limit himself to live in dependence on God. And in John 5, he says these words. He says, listen, the son is not able to do anything of his own, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son likewise does these things. Jesus lived in dependence on the Father. And as you and I listen to the voice of God, as we are looking for the activity of God, when we see God at work around us, we are to take turn, we have to turn and to take notice and see what God is doing and ask God, what are you calling me to do? Friends, God is working on your campus before you showed up there. But do you see it? God is working in your job places before you showed up there. Have you noticed it? God's working in your family. Have you noticed it? 
God's working in your community. Are you paying attention to it, or are you so caught up, consumed in your life that you miss out on what God is doing? Listen, God has a vision of what he wants to do. And he's not asking you and I to dream up big dreams for him and to solve problems that confront us. He's asking us to walk so intimately with him that when he reveals that what he is up to, when he reveals what is on his agenda, we will immediately adjust our agenda to his will and the results will bring glory and honor to God. Listen, God is not looking for you and I to come up with a great plan or a great strategy. God has a plan. He's already up to something in our city. He's already up to something in our workplaces before he puts you there. He's already moving on your campus before you showed up. He's doing something in your family and in your friends and in your streets and in your neighborhood. God has a plan. God is on mission, and he is inviting you and I to join what he's doing. His desire is that we pay attention, that we look for the activity of God. We're, listen to, we're called to listen to the voice of God to look for the activity of God and to live in dependence on God. Number three, we're called to live in dependence of God. And this is where we'll spend the rest of our morning. God is calling us to listen to the activity, voice of God through prayer, through his word, through people around us. He's calling us to look around our lives to see where he's moving and what he's doing but he's calling us more than anything to live in dependence on God. And that's the lesson that God is teaching Moses in Exodus 3 and 4. Moses needed to develop in character. Friends, when God spoke, Moses still had a lot of flaws. He still had a lot of issues. He wasn't a finished product yet. Moses got, had still had some work needed to be done in his life. God was still at work in him, meaning all of us have areas in our lives where we need to grow. All of us have areas in our lives where we need to invest in. All of us have areas in our lives where Jesus wants to work on us to make us more holy. If we understand that, if we understand that, it changes us both inwardly and outwardly. Inwardly, when we understand that we need to grow, it produces a deep sense of humility. As we realize that God wants to take someone broken like ourselves and use us, it ought to give us humility. I understand who I am. I understand the wickedness of my own heart. I know the weaknesses of my own flesh. I know that it is only by God's grace that God can use me to any capacity at all. When we understand who we are and who he is, it should give us a deep sense of humility that God is willing to work through us. But then outwardly, what it should produce is a deep understanding of patience toward others. To be patient with one another. Because here's what you know. You know that you're not done yet. And you know that they're not done yet. The ones that you're praying for, the ones that you are influencing, you know that God is working in them, and so you be patient. And we get to the principle of dependence. We understand we all need to grow because there's a deep sense of humility on the inside and patience on the outside. Listen, none of us in this room has arrived. We're not done yet. We are a work in progress, and so we need to grow. And at this stage is where God is growing Moses into dependence on him. See, Moses made this classical mistake when it comes to being used by God. He thought that God had a plan, and that Moses had to get it done. The reality is that God has a plan, and God is going to accomplish his plan. God just wanted to use Moses in that plan. You can almost entitle Exodus 3 and 4 as the excuses that make Moses makes. The entirety of these two chapters, Moses is telling God why he is not the guy for the job. And by the end of it, Moses says, you know what? I have no other excuses. I'm just going to quit. Let's look at them real quick. Number one, the first excuse that Moses makes, you find that in verse 7 of chapter 3, God can't use me. I'm a nobody. Look at verse 7. He says, the Lord said, I have now listen to these words. The Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people 
I have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their sufferings. Moses isn't even in the story yet. And I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians. And I have come to bring them from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, the territory of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Parasites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And so because of the Israelites' cry for help has come to me and also seeing the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. You hear this? God says, Moses, I have a plan. Moses, I am showing up. Moses, I am going to deliver them. Moses, I have seen it. Moses, this is what I'm going to do. Moses, this is about me. And then look at verse 10. Therefore, go. I have all this stuff planned out. Go. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Verse 11, Moses asked God, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses is basically saying, God, I'm a nobody. God, I've been basically taking care of sheep for the last 40 years on the backside of the desert. I have no influence. Nobody in Egypt knows I exist. Nobody among my own people knows I exist. God, I'm a nobody. But look at verse 12. God says, I will be with you. And this will be the sign that I am the one that sent you when you bring the people out of Egypt all you will all worship at this mountain. You know what God's answer was to Moses' excuse? Moses, you may be a nobody, but I'm a somebody, and I'm with you. And I'm with you. Moses says, God, God says to Moses, Moses, it's not about who you are. It's about who I am. Look at the second excuse, verse 13. Moses asked, God, if I go to the Israelites and they say to them, God of your fathers have sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? Here's Moses' second excuse. God, you can't use me. I don't know enough. I'm not educated enough. I'm not qualified enough. You ever been there? Oh, if I live for Jesus and if I begin to live my faith out, people are going to ask me questions, and all of a sudden I don't have answers to them, and then I'm going to embarrass Jesus. I need to learn more before God can use me. God, I can't lead a Bible study. God, I can't go and serve on a mission trip. God, I can't get involved in church activity my MCG is doing. I don't know enough. And look at verse 14. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. From this word, we get the root word Yahweh or Jehovah. It means to be. And the primary meaning of this word is to reveal truth about the eternal character of God. Here's what God is saying to Moses. Moses, you may not know enough, but I know everything because I have always been and I will always be. Moses, I am Alpha, I am Omega, I am Beginning, I am End, I am the First, I am the Last. There's never been a time when I wasn't here, and there will never be a time when I will not be here. There may be some things that you might not have any answer to, but Moses, I am the answer. You just depend on me. Look at the third excuse. Go down in chapter, chapter 4, verse 1. Here's Moses' third excuse. God, you can't use me. I will fail. Moses answered, verse 1, what if they don't believe me? What if they won't obey me but say God did not appear to you? God, what if I go and all of a sudden I just fail miserably? God, what if I go and no one accepts me? God, what if I go and I embarrass you? I won't take time to read it, but the next few verses, here's what happens. Moses is carrying his shepherd's staff with him. And God says, take that staff and throw it on the ground. Now, that doesn't take a whole lot of faith. But what happens next takes a whole lot of faith because that staff turns into a snake. I would have jet by then, right? Um, but Moses stands there. And then the next thing God says is, pick up that staff or pick up that serpent. So Moses grabs that serpent and it turns into a staff. Here's what's interesting. From that mo moment forward, Moses' staff is never referred to as Moses' staff again. Every time again that it's referred to in the Old Testament, it's referred to as the staff of God. God is teaching Moses with that staff that it's not about your failures or your abilities. It's about my power. It's not your power. It's my power. And then God tells Moses, Moses, take your hand and stick it into your coat. Moses does, and he pulls it out, and his hand is full of leprosy. God says, all right, put it back in. He sticks it back in, 
pulls it out and it's completely healed. Here's what God is showing Moses. Moses, listen, you can't do anything. But I can. You're not going to change the hearts of any individual's lives. You're not going to convince anyone to believe in me. But I can. You're not going in your own power, Moses. You're not going in your own ability, Moses. You're not going in your own might, Moses. You're going in my power. And I will not fail. There is, I have all power. I am omnipotent. There is nothing outside of my sovereign hand. Look at the fourth excuse, verse 10. And here's the excuse. God, you can't use me. I have way too many weaknesses. I have way too many flaws. Verse 10, Moses replied, God, I've never been eloquent, either in the past or recently, since you've been, or since you've been speaking, like literally in the last 10 minutes, because my mouth and my tongue are sluggish. You ever say something like that? I've got way too many weaknesses. I can't be used by God. I don't have the skills. I've got limitations. I have weaknesses. I'm not adequate enough. And look at how God answers in verse 11. He says, Moses, who placed the mouth on humans? Who makes a person mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I? Now go. I will help you speak. I will teach you what to say. Have you forgotten who made you? Here's what God says to Moses. Moses, you may have weaknesses, but don't forget. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Just trust me. And even after all of that, Moses is still on the fence. And in verse 13, basically he says, God, there's no way you can use me. I quit. Look at verse 13. God, please, please send someone else. And God, through this process, through this conversation, knocks out every excuse that Moses makes. And here's the basic principle that God was teaching Moses. And here's what God is teaching us. Whatever you and I are not, he is. Whatever you and I are not, he is. And he, by his grace, has chosen us and redeemed us and called us to live more than just simply earning a paycheck or living a comfortable life. He's called us to radically live our lives for Jesus, to be a blessing to the people that he brings into our lives, to influence the community that he's placed us in, to touch the community that he has graciously gathered us around. He's called us to be people that can be used by him. Can I ask you, are you listening to the voice of God? Are you spending time with Jesus? If you aren't, can I invite you to do this? You want to want someone to hold you accountable? I'll hold you accountable if you hold me accountable. Right? I am trying. I've never read through the Bible in a year. I've read through the Bible. That'd be bad if I haven't. Uh, I'm a pastor. But I've never done it in a year. So I'm trying to do it this year. And I'm, I'm already missed two days. So if some of you want to hold me accountable and text me, Hold me accountable, I'll hold you accountable. Let's read together. Let's spend time together with Jesus. Let's be people that are intentionally listening to the voice of God. Let's be people that say, God, more than anything else, I want to hear you. This year, I want to be so in tune with you that when you say go, I'll go. And when you say stop, I'll stop. That whatever you ask me to do, I'm not going to see if it fits into my agenda. If you're asking me to do something, I will rearrange my agenda to bring glory and honor to you. Friends, are you listening to the voice of God? Because if you're not listening to the voice of God, you're listening to the voice of someone else. And someone else's voice will lead you to a path of destruction. Are you listening to God's voice? Are you looking... For the activity of God. Do you see God at work where you're at? Do you see God moving in your neighborhoods? Do you see God working and moving in your families? Are you living in dependence on God? 
Moses becomes convinced. Look down to verse 20. So Moses took his wife, his sons, he put them on a donkey, returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took God's staff in his hand. Every time Moses was in a tight spot, that staff in his hand was a reminder that it was God who called him, that it was God who was faithful, that it was God who would use him. That staff reminded him of the power, the presence, and the faithfulness of God. And here is Moses, 80 years old, all kinds of excuses of why God can't use him. And then from Exodus 4, from then on, we read the next 40 years of Moses' life, how God used him to become one of the greatest leaders in the history of this world. And I want you to, I want to close with reading the end of the story. I want to read the end of the story in Deuteronomy 31. It's been 40 years. He's led the people out of Egypt, the plagues, and all that stuff that's happened in Egypt. He's crossed the Red Sea miraculously. They've received the Ten Commandments. They've built the tabernacle. The manna has fallen from heaven. All sorts of victory over enemy enemies that were in the land. All the stuff that has happened over 40 years. And now it's time for Moses to hand the baton over to Joshua, the next leader. This Moses who was weak and full of excuses in Exodus 3 and 4. Look at how he closes his life. Deuteronomy 31. Verse 7, he says, Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all of Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you will go with this people into the land the Lord swore to give to your fathers. You will enable them to take possession of it. The Lord is the one who will go before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you. He will not abandon you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Listen, every excuse that Moses made in Exodus 3 and 4, he is saying, listen, God proved those excuses wrong in Deuteronomy 31. Every excuse you and I will make of why God can't use us, if we would just simply say, God, I don't feel good enough, but I think that you can use me. And if you want to use me, you'll use me. You'll come to a point in your life and say, where I was weak, he was strong. Where I never thought he could use me, he ended up using me. Listen, when Moses was saying that, he was saying that with 40 years in the rear view, in the rear view mirror of seeing God with him every step of the way. And he says, Joshua, don't worry. God will be with you. He will do what he said. He will go above and beyond anything you can ask or think, Joshua, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about your weaknesses or your skills or your talents. You don't have to worry about if people will accept you or don't accept you. God will use you. By the grace, Moses was used by God in ways he never thought he could ever be used. And friends, if you and I would live listening to the voice of God, looking for the activity of God, living in dependence on God. You and I will be used by God in ways we have never imagined. And there will be people in our lives who will know Jesus or experience Jesus because we were willing to trust Jesus. Can I invite you this year to be people who listen to God's voice. Can I be invite you wherever you're at? Look for what God's doing. Look for what God is working and how God is moving. Let me close with this. You don't have to be used by God in powerful ways like up here on a stage or singing, or in a community group. Maybe that's not what God is calling you to do. But God is calling you to look, live your life in dependence on him, listening to him, and looking for his activity. And it can be something as simple as this. Imagine leaving here this morning, and you go to a restaurant to eat, and you're eating together with your family, and you're enjoying time together and your waiter or waitress is serving you but you're looking for the activity of God and God begins to put that waitress into your heart now this is a hypothetical scenario and you just say hey um, tell me about you right? I mean you just you just begin a conversation with that waitress 
And maybe she's having a horrible day. But you're looking for the activity of God. And you begin to speak to her. And she tells you about her horrible day, and you just simply say, you know what? I'll be praying for you. That's it. And you leave. You don't make much of it. But what if that little words, I'll be praying for you, begins to stir something in this waitress's heart? Right? And all of a sudden she's like, oh, I haven't thought about Jesus in a while. Again, hypothetical speaking. And she's, let's just keep making stuff up. She's, <laughs> she's a single mom raising a kid by herself, and she just says, you know what, I need to get back in church. And that next Sunday she ends up in a church somewhere. And her son grows up to pursue Jesus, love Jesus. Let's just say he goes to a hard part of the world. And he dies sharing the gospel, maybe never reaching anyone. Maybe he reached one person, and that one person he reaches is the reason an entire nation comes to Jesus. Let's go backward. An entire nation comes to Jesus because one person was willing to go that person was willing to go because his mom took him to church. His mom took him to church because one day when she was serving as a waitress, someone just said, hey, I'll be praying for you. That person said that because that person was looking for the activity of God in their lives. When you and I look for the activity of God in our lives, we will have no idea the impact we will have. We're not called to look for impact. We're looking to be faithful. I will be amazed if you and I lived our lives constantly looking for God's activity when we get to heaven, the impact our lives would make because we simply were obedient to Jesus. And I invite you as a church to be people listening to the voice of God, looking for the activity of God, living in dependence on God. As we come to communion, We know that none of this is possible without Jesus. We know that without Jesus, we would have no opportunity to hear his voice. Without Jesus, we wouldn't see God moving or working, and we would be blinded. We wouldn't be able to put our dependence and trust on him. And so when we come to communion, we are acknowledging, God, this is not my life, this is your life. And because of the work of the cross, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, I now belong to you. Would you use me for your glory? And so I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, your attitudes, your motives, your actions, your desires, your fears, your excuses. Would you surrender them to Jesus and then would you come to the table this morning saying, God, I don't think you can use me, but if you desire to use me, would you use me for your glory? Let's worship.